we should have, we hopefully will have some time for Q&A, you know, after the end of the presentation. So um, a very, very brief introduction. The, yeah, of course, everyone's bio is in the materials that you have. Uh, so um, uh, Sarah Wilson is the first presenter and uh, she is um, uh, the professor of uh, history of modern and contemporary art at the Courtauld University of London. And, uh, and she was the principal curator of Paris, capital of Paris, 1900 to 1968, and also uh, of the fifth uh, Guangzhou Triennial at the Guangzhou Museum of Art, among many other accomplishments. Um, uh, the second speaker will be Zaina Masri, who is a um, uh, senior lecturer in global visual culture at the University of Bristol. She is the author of the award-winning book, Cosmopolitan Radicalism, The Visual Politics of Beirut's Global 60s, uh, which was published in 2020. And uh, she's also uh, authored many other uh, texts. So please, uh, uh, Sarah, Thank go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, all thanks, of course, to SOAS, to the British Academy, and above all to Hamid and to Fatima as well for this tremendous conference and to new colleagues and friends from yesterday from whom I learned so very much. Uh, first of all, as I've learned from my dean at the court hall, I must give you a content warning that this talk uh, involves some... Um, some strong and possibly painful images to those who see them for the first time. And in this talk, I cannot rehearse, of course, the bibliography of deportation and Holocaust studies, French Holocaust studies, the classics of Anglo-American trauma studies from Cathy Carruth to Griselda Pollock, nor the history and complex politics of the Syrian uprising after 2011, nor Iran and Russia's geostrategic objectives, so crucial for the wider tragedies unfolding in the world today. And of course, for every time I talk about torture um, in Camp 227 in Damascus, I could be talking about Ukraine or Gaza. And on the other hand, while Hamid spoke specifically in his introduction yesterday of countering the persistence of Eurocentric knowledge, Western theories and methodologies, I'll be presenting some of these as a constitutive part of the Syrian artist Nadja Albukai's practices and procedures, and interrogating their place in, this, in, in his own personal narrative of torture, exile, escape, and artistic practice. Oh, so now I'm pressing the... Oh, sorry, hold on. <clears throat> So today I want to describe the encounter between Syrian artist Naja al Bukai and the artist Boris Tazlitsky, who saw himself as French, born Russian, but whom I learned at the moment of his retrospective at this astounding swimming pool museum, La Piscine in Roubaix, just 20 minutes on the tube from Lille, um, was born of Ukrainian parents. They fled to France following the pogroms of 1905. His father died fighting for France in the First World War. While, as you can see from the poster, Tazlitsky painted working-class subjects realistically, he is in fact France's greatest Holocaust painter, a returned deportee from Buchenwald. As a, oh, sorry. As a communist and realist painter, entirely at odds with the avant-garde of his time, Tazlitsky was shunned by the art establishment. Art establishment. Hence I, a, a young doctoral student working from the Pompidou Centre, was sent to see him in 1980. He was a mentor and friend until his death in 2005, and I was associated with the acquisition of his works by Tate. So then, of course... Naja Albukai at the exhibition preview, an amazing chance photograph I took. Bearing in mind my article on Tazlitsky's 1952 trip to, to Algeria, my catalogue essay for his retrospective was already alert to issues of intersectionality, links already made by international curator Okwui Enwezo in 2000, and the Ghanaian scholar Adewui Adojei, whose Holocaust studies and post-colonial trauma was published in 2021, following Michael Rothenberg's Decolizing Trauma Studies, also of 2021. 
I did not expect, however, to see the work of Naja Abulkai in an accompanying show of contemporary work in Roubaix, nor by chance to meet the artist. My book, The Visual World of French Theory, is based on real counters that might never have happened between French philosophers and artists, fortunately underpinned by Louis Althusser's notion of the philosophy of the encounter. Thanks to that chance encounter with Naju Ab Naja Abulkai, I'm here with you today, without, of course, any SOAS credentials. Uh, Naja described to us how, in the dreaded prison 227, the interrogation, military interrogation centre in Damascus, known as the most notorious place for torture, he'd had in, a, in an area involving 3,200 prisoners covered with blood and suppurating infectious wounds to clear out and arrange decomposing and um, at firstly arrange decomposing corpses out of the way of the other people and then carry them out in unbearably overcrowded unhygienic conditions just as Taslitsky had had to do in his internment camp in Buchenwald. This is what gave me a big shock. This engraving, subsequently purchased by the museum, should rank with the famous Brooks slave ship engraving of 1788 in depicting the intolerable and overcrowded conditions in Syrian prison camps to this day, where the imperative was not to live or to sleep, but to breathe. And the um, Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, based in Britain, uh, says that 6,114 people have been killed since March 2011, involving civilian and non-civilian deaths, not including the 55,000 pe people tortured to death in these um, prison camps. My question, then, was about Tazlitsky's own first encounter sorry, about Albukai's first own encounter with Taslitsky's work, an encounter in the present, but going back in time, of course, that asked questions about imagined subjectivities, shared formal repertoires, transtemporal, intercultural, and as I shall propose, prospective memory, the problem of empathic response and ultimately the place of art made imagined or remembered images without words within trauma itself prior to trauma, post-colonial, decolonial, or what we now might call ambi-colonial studies. Last week I was at the Russian-Ukraine conference at the Courtauld where our former student Svetlana Bidrieva, uh, dealing with this very complicated project of the relation of Sovietized Ukraine to the imperial project of the Soviet Union has coined this phrase ambi-colonial which is much to do much more to do with this and that exchange and the ambiguous nature of it so a new term for you um, my essay on Kataslitsky couched him as a revolutionary romantic Albukai shares this condition, non-French, yet immersed not only in French culture, coexisting with Syrian, but the kind of lineage of the revolutionary tradition, David, uh, and the wonders of French culture. From the moment he found his uncle's Petit Larousse, Little Larousse dictionaries in the family loft, he is, of course, darker than Taslitsky. He would perhaps consider himself a post-colonial subject with regard to a white Frenchman. But with Taslitsky's shares, I would argue, and despite his trauma, a feeling of the tradition and camaraderie of the School of Paris. Just to mention that for Taslitsky, too, the geopolitics of the time were immensely complicated, full of propaganda and counter-propaganda. And you can see, of course, that in these decors he did, for, he ma managed with a whole team, of course, for the um, uh, um, 12th Part Communist Party Congress of 1950 in Deco. He was entirely Stalinist at one point. Not, nothing is being disguised here. Huge sums of money were at stake for the USSR in America in terms of propaganda and counter propaganda in t terms of what was now and very frighteningly a new nuclear arms race. The ar argument then of the Soviet gulag pitched against the camps but encountered always by the other side as propaganda. What I want to talk about here is now the instrumentalization 
of works depicting concentration camp horrors because by 1950 his um, oil painting of Daniel Casanova was used in arguments against by the party in arguments against the European Defence Community Alliance uh, and uh, but other points to make which are not to do simply with this instrumentalization are on the one hand it is copied from an old it is compositionally copied after an old master painting at the Louvre, sur Baran, as you can see above, and more intimately, if you th can think of all these things going on at once. In fact, he learned during his own period as a prisoner that his own mother had been deported to Auschwitz and murdered, and therefore depicting this female in Auschwitz was obviously an internal tribute to his mother. Also, it's exceptional in as much as it's about a woman, while for both uh, Taslitsky and for Nabukai, and I'm not trying to disguise this in any way, the whole production and the whole discourse was always about l'homme, man, within the context, of course, of the humanist discourse post-war. There was an exhibition on the forgotten women of Buchenwald in 2005, but indeed they are very, very forgotten in terms of the type of things that I'm saying and showing you. Um, Buchenwald was the subject of a paper I gave last um, October, coinciding precisely with the Hamas attack in Jena with a trip to Buchenwald, and my paper was called Returning to Boris Taslitsky because his own painting um, was removed from National Museum display in 1952, again because of political reasons, the actual signing of that defence treaty. It was considered very in inappropriate to have such anti-German propaganda and only resurfaced, if you like, as a new, and because it hadn't been exhibited, a very freshly painted work as the apotheosis and culmination point of jean Claire's exhibition in the Quirinale in Rome, devoted to the 500th of anniversary of Dante's Inferno in 2022, fulfilling, as I argued at the time, the actual thrust of Zygmunt Bauman's very famous work, Modernity and the Holocaust, which sees the Holocaust as a kind of rational end product of the combination of racism and bureaucracy. But, um, uh, uh, you know, that's, um, that's that. Um, however... If we go back in time, it was actually before deputation, deportation. And this is when Taslitsky, after several other camps, ended up in the Riom prison, where he had access to painting and drawing materials and even started a little kind of prison university, that he painted the, daily, the monthly weigh-in of prisoners who already being given substandard rations and essentially being starved to death. This is where his job was to take out the corpses. I argue, therefore, that for Taslitsky, a young intellectual engaged with German émigré communist and anti-fascists in Paris, the betrayal of his status as a French citizen and a patriot, remember his father's death, dehumanised and starved in France, forced to carry the corpses of his countrymen, was the greatest shock. Buchenwald came after, and you can see how he's elongated bodies in a sort of El Greco-like way, which of course gives them extra mobility, uh, extra nobility. This was worked up as a uh, a far more shocking but less poignant oil painting after the war. His first vision of, of Buchenwald was entirely social. Indeed, he said beautiful in his memoirs of 1962. Never had the revelation of beauty appeared to me so strongly than at that instant when I made contact with the Gehenna of the quarantine camp. And what dominated all of the feelings was the pressing need to draw, to snatch from the dreadful reality of the permanent spectacle some of its most moving aspects. He both did these little sketches and much, much more worked up portraits of people for whom, indeed, if these works were preserved, might have been the last portrait of a living being. Julian Cain, the well, um, so I'm saying here, the well organized French communist resistance organization managed to smuggle Taslitsky material to draw, draw with. This would happen as well to Nadja. And even these, even larger format good paper for these finished portraits, such as fellow deportee Julian Cain, director of the um, National Library, the great Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. 
Taslitsky's deportation in August 1944 had been one of intellectuals, not of Jews. Through a stroke of fate, I could explain later, he was uncircumcised, which of course saved his life. The drawings on tiny scraps of paper were put on the first plane out of liberated Buchenwald long before Taslitsky returned to Paris. Some, now completely brown, almost illegible, deeply fragile, were preserved as well as disseminated by the French Communist Party thanks to the printing of this book, A Thousand and One Drawings, made in Buchenwald in 1946, with its captions not only in English and French but Russian, suggesting distribution in the Soviet Union. Um, and it's this question of preserving and through engraving, through print medium, that I'm going to come back to with Albuquerque. Um, <clears throat> the watercolours he made in Buchenwald, and you can see how this turns into this watercolour as part of a scene and then part of a larger scene, which is in fact the watercolour made on the spot once his little box of... Um, pocket-sized box of watercolours was miraculously returned to him before the liberation. Uh, the great painting itself being conceived as a great history painting, like a contemporary raft of the Medusa by Jericho, a comparison that was made at the time. So he amalgamated all these scenes in his head before being able to exhibit the great painting in 1946. But before leaving him and going back to our Syrian artists, the topic really of today's talk, I must show you nonetheless the drawings that Taslitsky made of Maurice Halbavachs, which some of you may not know, the great pioneer of collective memory, whose book La Mémoire Collective was published posthumously in Paris in 1950, but not published um, in English for a kind of Anglo-American Holocaust studies audience until 1992. He was a very great and revered sociologist with a huge publishing track record. And this is the most poignant Im uh, image of him actually in the infirmary, naked. I don't know how Teslitsky was able to make this image. Um, and yet his actual engagement with an imaginary Syria was, uh, is interesting in as much as he'd published in 1941. During the uh, German occupation, la, tobro, la, sorry, can't say it at top speed, la topographie légendaire des évangiles en terre sainte, evoking the long French bibliography on Syria as part of the Holy Land, constitutive of his um, study of Syria as an imaginary holy land, of course now entirely desecrated, desacralized. So to get back to this idea of, of intersectionality, um, of course it really surprised and revolted me many, many years after my first Pompidou experience to discover that the 8th of May 1945, celebrated by the French as VE Day, is actually the day of the huge massacres of soldiers who had fought for France, who were now fighting for liberation in Setif, Gelma and Kerata. Um, the countless numbers of victims are still a matter for debate among historians. And I've published an extensive analysis of the double trip he made around Algeria uh, with his female counterpart, Mireille Miai, and their propaganda exhibition of large socialist realist oil paintings made up from sketches drawn in 1952. Of course, this precedes the Algerian war. Um, <clears throat> praised, by, praised by the French and Algerian communist press, these toured Eastern Europe and were essential for the setting up of social and the reinforcement of socialist realist practices all over Eastern Europe. Taslitsky indeed drew figures from the Setif massacre who had been maimed. I couldn't find one of a man with le one leg. Um, sorry, I'm supposed to go on to this one. Uh, but the work on the left... Um, called Women of Iran is a study for, again, a very large social realist, very colourful oil painting, where the issue of women militants raising their veil can be retrospectively very interestingly read through Fans Fanon, Year 5 of the Algerian Revolution, published in French in 1949. Um, the war with no name. And you can see that this Communist Party, huge debate on colonialism involving figures you may know of, of course, like Aimé Césaire, happens in January 54, whereas the civil war breaks out, notionally speaking, in November. 
So back to at last to Naja Albukai, whom I thought when I met him was my discovery and thence had not done the enormous amount of preparatory homework I normally, of course, do in such cases, not really understanding that from the moment in 2018 he had had an almost special number of the French very, of course, left-wing, uh, left-wing newspaper Libération devoted to him. It had started the ball rolling in terms of exhibitions, interviews, TV coverage, Arte programs, and so forth. Uh, I think, uh, retrospectively, it did make our conversation very fresh and more intense. But, of course, that's not my normal practice. But here, without going into the historical text, you can see images of the brutalization of prisons, emptying corpses from a lorry, um, and then the specific tortures in particular the German chair, which is called the German chair because it was imported to Syria by a Nazi criminal, Alois Brunner, and the flying carpet. And some of these works were made with biro on paper. Um, once some some he had um, some he had drawing materials smuggled to him in the camp, but not until the very end of his seventy day period of detention for the second time in the worst prison camp two thousand and fourteen to fifteen this camp two two seven um, so sometimes so medium is important some things sometimes things are biro, but sometimes things are engraving, which comes later. Um, he escaped. And I was also very naive in as much I was shocked that each time he got out of the camp was not to do with some moment of liberation or politics, but the actual bribing of officials at very, very great family expense managed by his wife to do with, of course, an excessively corrupt system. But it's very moving that he also was able to make inside the camp, like Taslitsky's portrait of Julian Kerr and other prisoners, um, um, uh, portraits that were smuggled out by somebody who has been in the camp for 44... Who knows, uh, by a camp who's... Um, uh, for an incredibly long time. I was going to say 44 years. That sounds a bit improbable. I don't know. Anyway, a a prisoner who'd been for many years in the camp, possibly at least 10 years, who actually managed to take these on his mobile phone, we're talking about new technologies now, and get them to uh, Nabukai's wife, um, Albukai's wife, uh, via mobile phone. But again, you can see these are very, very different types of portrait heads, but another very poignant parallel. Of course, he was not only a tortured victim himself, but a, a, um, a, um, a, a close witness constantly of torture. And yet I discovered in the huge monograph that he was able to give me, thanks to which I have many illustrations today, again, a surprise. I didn't know that he was the kind of artist who already had a big monograph, a very prestigious monograph, that actually as early as 2009, somebody had got to him or he'd been interested in, in Syria, of course, a book of concentration camp drawings with this photograph from Mauthausen that already in 2009, long before his carceration, had inspired this copy. So the point is, I'm talking about the relationship between reality and experience and images that are all always already, to use Lacan's term, toujours déjà, in the head, and knowledge that is already second-hand knowledge, which bizarrely enough becomes first-hand knowledge in the flesh. This was another image in the book that showed him, of course, in Paris, reading uh, Holocaust literature. We don't know in which order, Elie Wiesel, Primo Levi, whose first edition came out in forty-seven, now a very much used paperback on his desk. Um, as I said, I don't know when that was phot- photographed. And I'm using this particular image of, of um, hanging prisoners being beaten, not only because he describes in one of those interviews how to get to the toilet one visit a day for 3,200 prisoners in that space you've already seen. You had to go past a corridor of men being hung by the arms and beaten with a cable, but also to introduce another theorist who experienced hanging, not in this particular way, but Jean Amery, whom, in fact, I never knew before this. Whoops, help, talk. 
um, who had had the same treatment um, being suspended, but talked about not only being overwhelmed and spiritually and physically overwhelmed by the prison experience, but also, uh, as I discovered in a fantastic article um, published only in 2001 by a scholar, Victoria Farold, in Sweden, that he had actually been imbued by reading Henri Alleg's work on torture and the Algerian war, and via Alleg, Franz Fanon, about the colonial question, before, in the light of the Frankfurt 1963 Auschwitz trial, he then started to write his own memoirs and his own philosophical thoughts, uh, going back to the very first publication on torture in 1949 about torture's reinvention in the 21st century, the republication of a book about mind rape published by a Soviet emigre in 1939, and of course for him the question of the intellectual in Auschwitz in his case, because the, uh, the fact that both, were, both artists were intellectuals is of very great importance. And I like the, I put that there because of the ambiguity between torture machine and printing press for his future practice. Now, of course, the uh, preface that Carr wrote for these 111 drawings was absolutely full of litanies of the names of great precursor artists, not only Goya, Jacques Callot, the engraver, David, and so forth, rather shocking to see how it distracts from the actual moment of intensity. Then Georges Saint-Prin, 20 years later, writes a fellow prisoner like Julien Quint, and the first Spain's first minister of culture, writes Writing or Life, La Littérature ou la Vie, in which he almost fictionalizes at that distance the death of Halvachs, uh, while uh, reading to him Baudelaire's poem The Voyage, while in fact Halbachs was dying in a pool of excrement with dysentery. So there is this big question about the role of literature. When at the Villa Medici, uh, sorry, the Villa, the Casa uh, um, Goya in Madrid, um, uh, the artist Albuquerque then encounters at close hand the engravings of Goya and copies them. And from Goya, he learns about the idea of caprichos, the actual humorous element, the element of the absurd that he introduced into his work. Not only are these little people always the same with shaved, gnome-like, or rather enlarged heads, but there is a poignancy that kind of fights with the idea of absurdity, but always the sense of the weight of those bodies that he's learnt in a way from Rembrandt's depositions. You can see here he explicitly copies Rembrandt, and yet in the work on the right, he adds those flying crazy figures that he's, that, that he's given a, a license, if you like, to add through Goya. It's a very, very interesting juxtaposition. And again, through, with Goya as well, this idea of the absurdity it's not just absurdity, but it's the absurdity of the fact that what he's trying to... Uh, of the absurdity of the incommensurate task of representation in these circumstances. Of course, there's obsessive repetition, but rather beautiful. You see how this work of 2021, again, uses those elongated figures, those additions of gouache, the care for drapery. Taslitsky, too, would incessantly repeat new tortured figures or the liberation from Buchenwald as a scene, uh, as a kind of trope that continued throughout his practicing life. Two and when we, two minutes, when we got to this, he talked about Buchenwald as a clownery. This was an idea that I had never permitted myself, despite talking about the influence of German expressionism on Taslitsky's work when I gave my paper in Jena. Uh, the idea that, well, the idea of these bright colours and so forth. I would just skip over the fact that Potaslitsky did a repetition in 57 in far different palette. His works were reproduced in commemorative brochures all the time and installed in, San, in Yad Vashem, adding huge, con, uh, huge pathos to the Jena conference in 2005. So I visited him in the 10th of September. 2024, and saw these kind of works strewn on his desk 
Um, here, the crown suggests to us those funny mythological figures in Max Beckman, combined with those motifs you've already seen, and new work, which goes all the way back to his very early bestiaries when he discovered those illustrations of insects and fish and so forth engraved in the Petit Larousse Illustré. But I want ending with these two images, both shown in, in Roubaix, both to talk about how the... Um, the light and dark creates a kind of Manichaean situation which goes beyond the actual subject matter. Again, something absurd here, the barber uh, in Roubaix, and the um, idea of the actual possible escape from everything via the dialectic of reversal that's involved in printmaking itself. There's a very, very strange dialectic at hand. But also in this final image exhibited in Roubaix, the obscene fact that the prisoners were supposed to actually create a huge image of Bashar el-Assad, their national leader, and of course sadistic torture. Finally, I hope you will agree with me that this idea of a juxtaposition, a going back, but a going back in present time, has a logic uh, and a reason to it that asks big questions about memory studies. I have actually engaged with the work of Boris Silunik, who writes in his big monograph, whose litany of, of, of precursors I found very unsatisfactory, of the psychoanalysis, psychoanalyst Gerard Hadid, who pros, proposed the notion of a, um, a, a, a leafy type memoir feuilleté, uh, but rather than these hold all terms, I'd like to propose the idea of these repertoires of literature or of art more like holding environments as proposed by the psychoanalyst D.W. Winnicott in 1953. So you need to end. Yeah, just my last sentence. So, um, might not, uh, so here, there is a chiasmus then at stake in reading al Bukai with Taslitsky, the diachronic, diachronic crossings of memory, retrospective and, I argue, prospective. Where is he going to go from here? al Bukai's past meets Taslitsky's future. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, Zena, would you like to begin your paper? everyone and thanks for coming. Uh, before I start with my paper I have two points I'd like to mention a bit of script. Um, one is that um, uh, being myself being from Lebanon these are indeed very very hard times. I live in the UK I didn't it's not that I traveled in these dangerous times. I live here. Um, I'm not saying this to, to sort of excuse um, perhaps a, a sloppy paper or uh, scattered thoughts or unfinished work, but um, it's because I've debated with myself whether I should be here today, whether it's, it makes any sense, whether it's ethical to be in the, in the space presenting a paper while um, loved ones, families, are, their lives are in danger, while, while whole neighborhoods are bombed and eradicated. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a question for me because it's, it's actually the first time since I've, um, I've lived through the war in Lebanon um, all of my life. This is the first time being outside. And I, it's a question that I want to raise because many of us here in this, in this conference, in this room, would have experienced this. Um, working on the Middle East, it's, it's, not, it's not escapable. And I think working on Iraq, Palestine, Iran, um, uh, Syria, it puts us in those difficult situations and questions. And it's, it's, it requests us to ask about our 
positionality, and maybe it's something that we might want to discuss, and I think this is the conference is the right platform for, for such questions. <laughs> Um, now, as you see, I'm here, <laughs> so I've decided to come here because I do believe that being outside also helps. I mean, there, there is something that as academics we need to, we have, to we, have, we have a contribution, we have something to say, even in, not even, but specifically, exactly in those very difficult moments, um, irrespective of how difficult it is on us emotionally. So in, in such difficult moments, we have a contribution to make, and that is specifically of speaking truth to power. And th with this is actually what brings me to the topic of my, uh, my paper today and to the second point about the question of bearing witness. And specifically in relation to solidarity with Palestine. And I think it's, it's, this paper cannot start without a nod of uh, academic solidarity with, with Palestine and with Palestinians, specifically in the past year uh, in Gaza, enduring a brutal machine of war or brutal conditions of, um, of geno genocidal war against them, that of, course, by, by, that of course has not just started a year ago, but has been ongoing. Perhaps this is one of its latest brutal uh, iterations that we are witnessing, but it has started since 1948 by the settler colonial state of Israel. So coming, um, what I'm going to be talk talking about is not uh, contemporary uh, artistic or uh, activist uh, practices in solidarity with pa Palestine, but historical ones. So I'm, that gives us a bit of historical perspective on on artistic activism or visual activism uh, in, in relation to, to, to Palestine and just also tells us a bit of the depth of that or the issues that are at stake that have continued to be ongoing and not something that started on 7th of October. Uh, so also, uh, this, I, what I want to say is also that this is um, part of a larger research project that I've been working on for the last two years, um, just to give you a brief note about it, about the project, and just to sort of situate or contextualize where I'm coming from and where the books that I'll be discussing uh, today uh, sit, uh, both historically but also in the archival material I'm, I'm looking at. Um, so my research, as its title here, Decolonizing the Page, the Visual Politics and Poetics of Arabic Books, is concerned with the visual culture of Arabic books dating from the 1950s through the 1980s, uh, and specifically during processes of decolonization, and therefore I'm historically and conceptually framing these books as both devices for and artifacts of uh, decolonization struggles. Uh, the period itself, culminating particularly during the 70s, saw a remarkable vigor in Arabic book art and design that matched the artistic, political, and intellectual fervor of, of the time. Publishing then was central to the decolonization of knowledge, imagination, and affect, aimed at a growing Arabic reading, uh, readership and at broader networks of transnational solidarity. I'll show you just some examples. Uh, so books in this case, uh, books at that time emerged as platforms for modern aesthetic experimentation and creative collaborations between visual artists, poets, intellectuals, and activists. So here we have an example of um, the artist, the Sudanese artist, uh, Ibrahim Salahi, uh, design and illustration of the book, uh, The Wedding of Zain by Tayyip Saleh, by a fellow Sudanese uh, post-colonial author. Uh, other examples, uh, this is, uh, uh, this is a, from the series uh, that was published in the early 70s it's a, by, by the state, by the Iraqi state. Uh, the Ministry of Information in particular, it's, a, it's an art series and it's coupled uh, Iraqi artist with contemporary with contemporary poets um, to create a series of illustrated poetry books, um, <clears throat> but also here the example uh, of collaboration between um, um, 
late Kamal Boula, late uh, Elias Khoury, who passed away, in fact, this year, no, uh, Lebanese novelist and Palestinian artist Kamal Boulata. And one more example is that of, this is just to contextualize, uh, is Mahyadine uh, Labad, uh, work, Egyptian artists whose work here, particularly for, for children. And I'll come back to, the, to, to them in a bit. Um, I think one key point is to also mention that this, this, this collection or this material has for, for a long time been, been um, uh, forgotten or not addressed. I mean, the post-colonial literature usually looks at the text in the books, and uh, it's, it's actually the text is disembodied from the material artifact, which is the book and its visuality, but also art history. There's been great works, but also there's, there's a lot of attention that's given to book arts like the, of a pre-modern uh, pre era, like the manuscripts and uh, um, manuscript traditions, Arabic traditions, but also on contemporary artist books. So, so there's, there's a bit of a gap or there's, an, there's a neglect to that post-colonial moment or moments of decolonization in which artists actually engaged in bookmaking and engaged with other intellectuals and, and writers in, in to explore the form and aesthetic form of the book. So the, the, this, the, the work I'm doing will, be, will, will have its main output in exhibition, but also mainly a digital platform. It's actually a digital historical resource where, in fact, um, much of this material um, that I've been, archival collections I've been working with or putting together for some time, uh, it's like around 250 books will be digitized and available uh, through this um, through this online platform, so through, through this resource, but also an exhibition that gives access of how do we even act, begin to understand the visuality of, of Arabic, Arabic books at this time. Um, this is just a snapshot of the cataloging process and the digitization on the right, um, which just gives you like the difficulty of also, because I'm looking at books that would be normally in the library and usually bibliographic systems in the libraries do not mention the artists involved in books. So if you look for, for, for that, it, you, you, you look for particular artists, it's very hard to find that. And sometimes book covers would be removed, etc. I won't go into that. You can ask about this question. But it's just about how do we expand bibliography to include artistic and visual contributions to, uh, in the cataloging process. So there's, yeah, the, this, is, uh, this is for thousands of books, actually. So only 250 will be selected for, for the online exhibition. So coming back to the question of bearing witness, and what I'm going to be presenting today specifically is, is only a, a selection uh, from a section of the exhibition that is entitled B Bearing Witness, where the visual politics of testimony and solidarity are enacted in and through books. Uh, and, and here, what would be speci specific provisio, that I'm not just talking about artists' books within that specific category, and it's, again, it's a bit of a fluid category that we might want to discuss later on. Um, I want to focus specifically on those books that are made in solidarity with Palestine. This is not only a timely political decision to focus on, but it is a reality that also emerges from the archive or from the ar archival collections that I've been consulting. Um, many historic events have uh, inspired artistic responses in the form of, uh, if, of books, um, uh, and that's also in that inspiration also inspired a new visuality of, book of, of the book, of the Arabic book, um, such as uh, the Afro-Asian anti-colonial solidarity, uh, Ban Bandung, uh, the Algerian War of Independence, the Suez War, uh, the 1967 Arab-Israeli War, and the Israel's successive campaigns of aggression and occupation of Lebanon. It is, however, the ongoing anti-colonial struggle of Palestinians that generates the, the lion's share of illustrated books and artists' books. The Palestinian cause is indeed paradigmatic of the creative ways in which books have been visually explored to provide testimony and express solidarity. Especially poignant among Arabic books of the period is the increased political enlistment of the documentary and the effective power of the visual. 
the deployment of visual politics in books corresponds with the rise of visual activism during the late 60s and 70s in the Arab world and far beyond. So the visual tactics of political activism, which was a staple of the period's radical print culture, uh, he, are here extended from the iconic documentary photograph or the ephemeral poster that you'll find on the street or the radical periodical to the full-length narrative and in-depth insight of a book. So provoked here, particularly the, historically, by, by the 1967 uh, defeat in the Arab Israeli war and the revolutionary framework of the Palestinian liberation struggle that followed, the conceptualization of art and politics was changing in the Arab world in the late 1960s and through the 70s. Several artists, particularly from what was known as the 60s generation, be they Egyptian, Iraqi, Palestinian, or Syrian, strove to revolutionize and democratize art's place within Arab societies. Many artists chose printed media, posters, periodicals, and uh, I want to argue also books, as their canvas for political action, expanding the purview of their art to the reproducible realm of everyday print culture. This is something I have already uh, demonstrated in, in my book, the previous book, uh, Cosmopolitan Radicalism, and, and something I'm working to develop also to understand the, the how the book becomes such a platform for visual activism. Uh, and just to also contextualize how artists thought of themselves or thought of their artwork at that time, um, just to quote here Burhan, the Syrian artist Burhan Karkutli, who wrote in 1971, pressing the Union of Arab Artists, which was still in its, in its foundation, to set up a printing press, and I quote him saying, if painting reflects revolutionary values, its dissemination in print across the Arab world will bring these values to every home and within the sight of every citizen. The politicization of art also displaced public viewing from the painting in the gallery space to the surface of the reproducible print. And here again I'm quoting from Kamal Bulata who wrote in his essay in 1970 towards a revolutionary Arab art, and I quote, painting which used to hang in Beirut's galleries now shrank to the size of a postcard or poster to be sold in hundreds in support of the war victims. Beirut's art galleries began to transform into a body without a soul, for the soul was freed in the streets, refugee camps, and guerrilla bases. Arab artists' engagement with books thus expanded the horizon of their art to the reprodu reproducible realm of everyday print culture, and more specifically to the circulat circulatory power of books. One specific example here is by the artist Nazir Naba, which in fact illustrates how that the idea of uh, books in, as uh, art thought of as, as to their, in, their, in terms of their reproducibility, but also their, their circulation, is uh, his, uh, his book, Al Ard Al Muhtalla, from the Occupied Land, which actually is, I don't know if you can read it because of the resolution, uh, it's, it's, he refers to it as Marid um, Mutajawil, as a mobile exhibition. So here the book is, is conceived by the artist as a mobile exhibition in response to particular political issues. Artists such as Nazir Nabha, Dia Al Azawi, Kamal Bulata, and Muna Saudi creatively explored the form of the book to express solidarity with Palestine's liberation struggle <clears throat> and bear witness to the plight of Palestinian refugees. Their books need to be seen in the political framework of the book as a democratic multiple. The artist's book here as a democratic multiple, as theorized by uh, Joanna Drucker, takes on the characteristic characteristics of the free and cheap circulation of books. This is the nature of the democratic multiple, she, she contends, it, the ready availability of an independent artist's vision in book form. <clears throat> and here she's expanding the understanding of, the, of the, the artist's book beyond the tradition or the French tradition of the livre d'artiste to be a more experimental platform that is available also through print. Um, while, while some of these artists that I've mentioned, Azawi, Bulata, or, or Nabha, 
hyphenated their art with graphic design practices uh, in their exploration of the printed book. Uh, others, in fact, embraced book design as a professional uh, practice. Uh, this is the case in particular of, of Mohyeddin al labbad who was trained as an artist, but who actually, for him, graphic design was a tactical alternative to an elite art market and an entry into public culture and into politics. He identified himself as a bookmaker, Sani al Kutub. Uh, and in the 1970s, directed his art to children organizing related workshops and writing explicitly about uh, decolonial artistic pedagogies. And you'll hear more from more about uh, Mohyeddin Labad in this art in, in, the, in the afternoon by Ismail Neshef, who's uh, presenting later. So just starting with some of the examples of Mohyeddin Labad's uh, work. Um, there are two examples here. One is um, the book that he that that um, that he actually um, co-published uh, with Dar al Fatah al Arabi, and this is it's a book on Palestine in stamps. It's a history of of, of Palestine given through stamps. Uh, that's edited by <coughs> uh, uh, Nabil Shaf and Hasna Mirdashi. And uh, co-published between the Dar al Fatah al Arabi, uh, which is a children uh, uh, publishing book that was founded in Beirut in 1974, uh, to which Mohyeddin Labad was the art director. And then he worked, um, he later founded in 76 the Arab Experimental uh, Workshop for Children's Books, Al Warsha Al Tajribiya Li Kutub Al Atfal. So here his involvement is not only in the design, but also in the, in the, in the publishing. The second one, um, and I want to stop a bit, I will say a few more about the other one later, is uh, again a historical book. It's a history uh, of Palestine through, uh, the post through a series of postcards, and it's the collection of uh, Azzedine Ella, uh, who was the PLO representative in Paris who was uh, murdered in 1978. And this is here where El Labad is also one of the co-editors of, of the book. Um, now, what these, bo what these books in their visuality do, in fact, is sub something different at that time for Arabic books. So these books, in fact, act as historical documents and archaeological traces, providing both visual and material evidence of a place and a people denied existence. And this is really against the, the Zionist myth of a land for a people, uh, a land without a people for a people without a land. Uh, like memorial books, as Susan Slimovich has observed, they provide material evidence of a pal Palestinian past. Memorial books, she notes, uncover narrative discontinuity brought about by war, dispersion, and traumatic loss. The book's content and argument in such examples rests primarily on its visual narrative as documentary evidence. It's making from collecting the artifacts and gathering information surrounding them to designing and publishing is in, in and of itself a collaborative act of resistance against historical erasure, against silencing. Often published in multiple language editions, such books reach out beyond the immediately concerned Arabic reading communities. They are made to travel, to build transnational networks of solidarity, and to appeal to international readers demanding justice. Another example here, and this is, um, this is a book uh, that is edited by, by Mona Saudi in time of four children testify. So it was a project that she developed uh, while working between 1968 and 1969 with Palestinian children aged between five and 14 <clears throat> who had been displaced by the 1967 war into the Baqa refugee camp in Jordan. Through drawing, Saudi helped them narrate their stories of war, displacement, and one would add also traumas, and subsequent lives in the camps. And to express also the fragile emotions and fertile imagination that pre preoccupied them. A selection of these drawings uh, were later on display in touring exhibitions which traveled from Jordan to Lebanon, Iraq, Sweden, Denmark, and Japan, to be eventually compiled into a trilingual book 
uh, in Arabic, French, and English, uh, that's entitled here in Time of Four, which you see the covers, the, the front and back cover as a uh, bilingual here. It was designed by the Palestinian artist uh, uh, Vladimir Tamari, who created a bes bespoke Arabic typeface, in fact, that is inspired by children's uh, handwriting. The book in itself was an experimental art object produced in Beirut to a high level standard of finish and printing quality for international distribution. Uh, and proceeds from the sales were to be invested in developing art and literature centers in Palestinian camps. The collection of drawings in this book, while testifying to the traumas of forced displacement as experienced by vulnerable children, also revealed their creative minds in responding to the adversity of their day-to-day -day realities. <clears throat> The therapeutic exercise of creative free expression that children enjoy using color, I'm sorry, <coughs> I'm losing my voice, using color and crayons also offers a solid record of their life world and the imag imaginative realms they inhabit. As innocent witnesses, children's drawings provide a raw testimonial to the violence and injustice that structure their lives uh, during wartime. One particular example here. Um, I just want to draw your attention to one particular example here where, where you have the, test, the drawings but also the testimony of one, one child, um, uh, Fatme, a girl called Fatme, who's six years old, and she's saying, I dreamt that the Israelis were following us and then stopped us and said, hold your hands up, and, and then shot us. This is what they did in Ain al-Sultan with our people. And uh, I think Saudi is asking her, did they destroy your home in Ain sultan Yes. Did you see that? No, I dreamt it. The visual evidence revealed in such drawings as compiled into books is damning. It makes for a deeply uncomfortable viewing and reading. War planes, wretched refugee camps, bombed homes, machine guns, death and fear are normalized into everyday life scenes mediated through a child's eyes haunting their imagination and shaping their understanding of the world. As readers, we are confronted, or viewers, we are confronted at once with the universal innocence of a child's colorful drawings and the particularity of the violent conditions that challenge this very innocence. It is the affective and documentary tension that resides in the visual narrative of these books that makes for this, their testimonial power. And just um, okay, let me move to uh, Dia Al-Azawi as a witness of our time. Um, so this is, uh, this, this is a bilingual book, or again, Arabic and English, edited and illustrated by the Iraqi artist Dia Al-Azawi, with a translation into English by the renowned Palestinian Iraqi novelist and literary critic Jabra Ibrahim Jabra. It was published by the Iraqi Ministry of Information in 1972 in a print run of 5,000 copies. The book presents the diary of a fidei killed during cr the crackdown of, by the Jordanian armed forces against the PLO in September 1970, or otherwise referred to in Palestinian history as the Black September. Palestinian, Palestinian guerrilla warfare had been on the rise as a popular armed struggle against Israel, particularly in the aftermath of the, the, the 1967 war. Its revolutionary momentum had threatened the Jordanian monarchy of King Hussein, who proceeded violently to suppress the PLO in a military assault um, in, that, in, in 1970 that targeted both Palestinian guerrilla bases and refugee camps in Jordan, resulting in the expulsion of thousands of refugees from the country and the relocation of the PLO to Lebanon. Black September had dealt a major blow to the Palestinian liberation struggle. It was perceived as a harsh betrayal by a compliant Arab regime enacting imperialist and Israeli strategies to maintain its power. Nonetheless, the events also galvanized international solidarity. Uh, here, I mean, further, uh, 
that it, and also gave further ideological impetus to a revolutionary Arab left's rise at once against the repression of post-colonial post Arab states locally and against imperialism on the world stage. Al-Zawi was among the, a number of Iraqi artists and intellectuals on the left who were drawn to the Palestinian liberation movement. While some had joined the, the ranks of the Palestinian guerrilla organizations, others, such as Azawi, drew inspiration from its revolutionary promise to reconfigure art's radical political potential in the post-1967 conjuncture. Centered on the figure of the Fida'i as the new revolutionary Arab subject, a witness of our time is one of Azawi's earliest artworks in solidarity with the Palestinian cause. The diary entries attributed to a supposedly fallen combatant presumed missing in action relate the day-to-day -day brutality of the battle and siege of Al-Hussein refugee camp. Azawi's drawings accompany the diary entries and fill the majority of the book's 96 pages, so it's not a small uh, uh, booklet, it's actually quite a book. Um, interspersed occasionally with press reports and revolutionary song which he uh, edited um, and curated or edited as, as a, and here we see the artist as researcher. So the diary closes poetically with a peculiar posthumous entry headed a day after death, which raises a doubt in the reader about the authenticity of the actual diary and leaves open the possibility of its being a work of fiction. Azawi claims that the original text was passed on to him by another Iraqi author, but does not deny that it might have been fictitious. We now know it is fictitious, uh, and it has been written. It's, it's, it's an article that's published in uh, Az Yawmiyat Ma'arik al Hussein, published in Al Hadaf in, in October 1970, and um, uh, that's, uh, that's been written by the poet, uh, Iraqi poet Sharif al Rubai. Rubai. But my question here, would it matter? Rather than a textual document acting as a historical evidence, it is here the artist, by way of the imagined figure of the Fida'i, who bears witness. A witness of our time is neither material evidence in a court of law, nor an ordinary document in the archive. It is an artistic expression of solidarity that invites another reading of history. And I want to conclude with a f show a few examples quickly of another uh, uh, event that actually called a lot of artistic solidarity, and that is Tal Zatar. Um, so with a similar urge to bear witness and aesthetically mobilize the politics of anti-colonial solidarity, artists and poets have collaborati collaboratively responded with words and images to violent events that hold deep emotional charges. And one of the key events is Tal Zatar in 1976. Um, it's another crackdown, I'll spare you the details, but an another crackdown on a Palestinian refugee camp, this time in Lebanon, uh, by um, the Lebanese Front, uh, which is a coalition of uh, Lebanese nationalists, uh, right-wing, uh, claiming to represent the Christian maritime establishment and acting as a surrogate of, surrogate to the, of the Lebanese state. Um, so uh, this was just a, a year into the civil war, or two years into the civil war in Lebanon, and it was this camp was on, on the east side of, of Beirut while well, it was being divided. So this sort of um, is important within that history, but also it's important to consider it within the, the, the collusion of the Syrian army, but also the silence of the Arab state uh, at that time. Uh, this was yet another major betrayal and severe blow to the Palestinian resistance and a moment of severe disenchantment with post-colonial Arab states, hollow promises of liberating Palestine. The example you see here is, um, is an illustrated book uh, by, um, poetry book by Moin, the Palestinian poet uh, Moin Psiso and the, uh, the artist Mona Saudi. Another example is the one by um, Kamal Bulata, uh, and based on uh, is the drawings based on them. Okay, so you can conclude in the next minute or so. Yeah, I will conclude. So just uh, just show you the examples and end with this last example of uh, also uh, Azawi. Uh, and I think I want to add here how they, they, these, to, with the quote also from uh, Lila Abu Lughud and Ahmad Saeed, 
who have argued that Palestinian memory is particularly poignant, a particularly poignant case because it struggle with and against a still much contested present. It, it thus presents a dissident memory, a counter memory that emerges under conditions of silenced history. So unlike the delib deliberate deployments of memory in projects of power attached to the nation state, dissident memory is mobilized to question the status quo in the name of a trauma that awaits historical redress. The artist's books in the examples I've shown, self-authored or collaboratively made, embodies in its visuality and materiality a political act of solidarity. The artwork here lies not in the single precious drawings on the page. Art is rather made in and through the reproducible and circulatory power of the book as a communicative and performative act. Illustrated books offer both detached visual evidence and emotionally charged ex aesthetic expressions. They mediate test testimonies of traumatic loss and experiences of war while also invoking agency and hope, demanding freedom and justice, saluting heroic figures, commemorating martyrs and making their cause visible. In visually emphatic ways, they creatively transform collective memories, especially of those denied speech and visibility into public history. In short, the books that I've shown here are made to bear witness. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah and Zena, for very rich and informative papers. So we have about uh, 12 minutes for uh, discussion, so I would like to open the floor for uh, questions. Uh, please raise your hands if you have questions or comments. Um, yeah, back there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my question is for um, Sarah. Um, you mentioned the word inter intersectionality, and I'm, I'm really curious um, about your use of that term, especially as it's become uh, quite well known in legal theory in the United States uh, in relation to um, black women and um, the carceral state, etc. cetera. Um, yes, well, I used it deliberately. And um, the point is when it's first started to be used, knocking around the court hall by other of my colleagues, I, um, I heard it and I never knew it's the extent of its field of resonance, if you like. And you could say, um, very genuinely speaking, that I didn't, uh, I can understand those things you've just described, of course, but there was a kind of emotional dimension where suddenly it clicked for me. And I may indeed be not using it in the conventional way in which it's used. But I think this idea of transtemporal, transcultural, transidentity, and everything. I mean, the whole of my experience with Teslitsky, he always used the word Russe. He never used the word Sovietique, of course. Uh, and he defined himself as Russe. Well, obviously, now he wouldn't. Um, but the idea that the contemporary situation in Ukraine makes one see him slightly differently, there were all sorts of things I didn't say. Um, about Nadja, I've just reread the fact that his father was English speaking, his mother was Catholic and French speaking. There are so many things going on that I find it a useful term to, um, if you like, and if I may, sort of expand in terms of the, its fields of reference in, in the way that I did. And I trust that that adds something rather than subtracting something to the way it first started to, became, to become used, if that's acceptable. That's my personal take on it. Yeah, question. <clears throat> uh, my question is for Zena. Thank you, Zena. It's really an amazing job. You have uh, compiled all these books, and it's uh, an amazing uh, history and amazing uh, collection. I have a, a question. Uh, did you did you come across any articulation of the tension between image and text in these projects? Did they uh, talk about it? Did they write about it? Because as you know, most of these writers and artists, they have their own projects. And the moment they collaborate, 
many different, uh, at least not clashes in the regular sense, but tensions uh, that, especially with this pioneering and uh, avant-garde, uh, at least at that stage in their life. So I wonder if you could elaborate more about this, this complexity image text at that point in uh, history. Thank you. So the tension is there, and I it's, I didn't have the chance to talk about it. But uh, some, like some artists or designers, have written about it. Like Labad writes about it, which you will you see in Nazar. But uh, but also Kamal Bulata has written a lot about that. His work has uh, his has a lot of writings about the tensions between image and text, and the, the what is the role of modern art in relation to 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 the the supremacy of text in Arabic traditions, but also how he, for instance, the work uh, that he did with Elias Khouri, he has, um, in the second edition there is, he has a preface where he actually writes his own views about, uh, about, uh, about the book, Abu Abel Medina. Uh, not many others would write about that, but it's something that comes out in interviews and discussions uh, with the Al-Azawi, uh, I mean, for, for Dia specifically, and not just here, they specifically that the work uh, that he does with how text becomes image in books is something that is, is in itself, I think, subversive uh, of that relation uh, of image to text, uh, the tradition of image to text, I think. Quick, quick answer. <laughs> I, I just wanted to follow up on exactly that. Um, you said the books you're looking at, it's still quite fluid, the ones you're looking at and, and all artists' books and this idea of democratic multiples. Are you going to examine the role of posters as sort of the first time using, you know, the sort of segue between the artwork, the democratic multiple, this use of image you know, uh, text as image and those kind of things. Is that something you're looking at? Well, I, I've worked a lot on posters before, so I think, and, and in my previous book, I've worked on looking at the range of media that uh, artists have explored during this time. What I'm trying to focus on now is very specifically books and not just artists' books, um, but, but, but really to understand how does the book offer something different than what we would see on the street in a poster that is ephemeral, but how, how does the book in fact, I mean the questions I have is really how the engagement of artists in books at that time changed the visuality of Arabic books. But so within the history of bookmaking from the 19th, or specifically the printed books since the 19th century in Ahda, uh, this was a critical time and that engagement changed the form of books, but also how we can look at these books with, in their visuality within that period, within that history of decolonization. How do we situate them? And what's the role of book that is books that is different, uh, that presents a diff in its visuality something different as in terms of knowledge production? And I think I, I'll come back to yesterday's uh, uh, a disc success uh, presentation on how artists contribute to, to knowledge making. And I think books are specifically sites in which this happens, but also books are specifically sites in which one can reclaim um, a tradition of bookmaking that has been uh, severed during, like in, in, during modernity with the, with the printing press. So there's a lot of coming back to the, the book arts but through modern reinterpretations and through political <coughs> forms of interpretation that I want to argue are part of that moment of decolonization. They are decolonial in their, in their approach. Uh, thank you, thank you, Zena, for this uh, amazing collection. My, um, I was wondering what's the status of these books in the trajectory of these uh, of these uh, artists, for example, Kamal Bolata, that I came out to know when he came later to Morocco, um, uh, 
he has also a documentary, for example, of his return to 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 Palestine, mm. and uh, at a certain time, uh, maybe move into other uh, formats of of uh, of, uh, of expression became more urgent. Uh, the same for the Azawi uh, later, etc. So, uh, what's the status of of these books in the, the uh, configuration? of their work? It's, a, it's another important question because I, I think it also says more about that period in which these artists that you just named, um, uh, Diala Zawi or Kamal Bulata, worked specifically with published books during that time. It's later on that they experimented with the more with, with, with the, the convention or the category of the artist books, the, the unique uh, object of, of art that is made into a single single form. And that's something that you see in Kamal Bulata's uh, artist books of the 90s, but also you'd see in Dia al Azawi's later work in the 80s uh, as he was in, 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 as he in fact came to, to London in 76. So there's, it's, and I think 76 is critical when I showed Telazata is that moment of disenchantment and where you're part of a publishing endeavor, part of a, uh, that uh, a, a moment, a an important po political moment in the Arab world and once you're exiled or self-exiled, there's something else that happened and it becomes the artist in his studio making that singular, that's my interpretation now, it's just very preliminary making a singular art unique object rather than being part of the circulatory power of the book. I think that's something I'm, I'm toying with as an idea. I also want to thank you, um, Zaina, for the amazing uh, presentation. And um, I'm wondering, as you said you were looking at these historical ones, and they're some of my favorites as well, do you see um, a sort of a, a, a new or uh, a contemporary kind of interest in that? I mean, you know, the 2003 Iraqi Dafatar were also witnesses of, of a moment. But do you see this happening now, for example, as, as uh, with the, the, the contemporary artists, with the younger artists? I mean, issues of solidarity are very different uh, as we see it, right? So I'm curious. Do you want to yeah, I just wanted to to sort of follow on from that because there is, um, as the the work that I I did with the collection at the Brit British Museum of artist books, which are a, a sort of in a way this kind of side category, which are different from the multiples you're yeah. you're talking about, and and I was very struck by how so many contemporary artists are still turning to the form of the book. And often they're, they're, they're very sort of private, a lot of them. You know, it's their engagement with poetry, but also that they are witnesses as, as well. So it is a question about, it's almost like there are sort of parallel streams going on, which are kind of in, interconnected too. I don't know if you would like to comment I about those two. Yeah, yeah uh, Venetia has answered the question of Nada. So there is... Uh, in the, the, the issue is that um, there is a new generation that also works with the book and with different circumstances than the ones before, uh, but they also produce, I think, different forms of books. And I think that relation between the book art and publishing is, is something to, to uh, whether it's part of a publishing initiative or whether it's self-published or an, that category of the artist book is something to, to really consider. But there's also different media in terms of the witness, witnessing today, specifically in the past year. So much is, that is what we see on social media and a lot of artists are, this is another way in which their artwork is reproducible rather than books. You see some of the work of Mazen Kerbej, the work of uh, Jana Trabulsi uh, in relation to Reza in the past year is quite powerfully distributed freely uh, through social media. And you can see what's so powerful is that you can see their images printed by different people across the world and used in, in protests. So I think that's the power of the, the circulation in electronic media also today. So with that, um, we have to call this uh, session to a close. Please join me in thanking uh, Sarah and Zen. <laughs>
a 20-minute break for coffee? Yes? Okay. So please.